Okay. I'm gonna start on chapter 10 now. <clears throat> on page 182. Okay. Um, America's new ship of state did not spread its sails to the most favorable breezes. Within 12 troubled years, the American people had risen up and thrown overboard both the British yoke and the Articles of Confederation. A decade of law-breaking and constitution-smashing was not the best tra training for government-making. Americans had come to regard a central authority, replacing that of George III, as necessary, but also something to be distrusted, watched, and curbed. The finances of the infant government were likewise precarious. <coughs> Excuse me. The revenue had declined to a trickle, whereas the public debt, with interest heavily in arrears, was mountainous. Worthless paper money, both state and national, was, a plentiful, was as plentiful as metallic money was scarce. America's precarious national security was also threatened by the wars that rocked Europe in the wake of the French Revolution of 1789, an event that also roiled domestic politics in the fledgling United States. In the face of all those difficulties, the Americans were brashly trying to erect a republic on an immense scale, something that no other people had attempted in the traditional political theory deemed impossible. The eyes of a skeptical world were on the upstart United States. Even after the battles over adoption of the Constitution, conflict continued to rage about the nature of government. Some, such as Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, supported a limited government, and others, such as George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, hoped to extend the powers of the government in order to create institutions that could strengthen the new country. Political fights of the, Washing of Washing of the Washington and Adams years made for a, con for a contentious start to the early republic. Growing Pains When the Constitution was launched in 1789 and the republic was continuing to grow at an amazing rate, Oh, wait. <laughs> when the, the Republic was continuing to grow at an amazing rate, the population was doubling about every 25 years, and the first official census of 1790 recorded almost 4 million people. Cities had blossomed proportionately. Philadelphia numbered 42,000, New York 33,000, Boston 18,000, Charleston 16,000, and Baltimore 13,000. America's population was still about 90% rural, despite the flourishing cities. All but 5% of the people lived east of the Appalachian Mountains. The Trans-Appalachian Overflow was con concentrated chiefly in Kentucky, Tennessee, and Ohio, all of which were welcomed as states within 14 years. Vermont preceded them becoming the 14th state in 1791. Foreign visitors to America looked down on their noses at the roughness and crudity resulting from an axe and rifle pioneering life. People of the western waters and the stump studded clearings of Kentucky, Tennessee, and Ohio were particularly res restive and dubiously loyal. The mouth of the Mississippi, their life-giving outlet, lay in the hands of unfriendly Spaniards. Smooth-talking Spanish and British agents, jingling gold, moved freely among the settlers and held out seductive promises of independence. Many observers wondered whether the emerging United States would ever grow to maturity. Washington for President George Washington, the esteemed war hero, was unanimously drafted as president by the Electoral College in 1789, the only presidential nominee over, ever to be honored by unanimity. His presence was impo imposing, six feet, two inches, 175 pounds, broad and sloping shoulders, strongly pointed chin, and pockmarks from smallpox on nose and cheeks. Much preferring the quiet of Mount Vernon to the turmoil of politics, he was perhaps the only president who did not in some way angle for his, this exalted office. Balanced rather than, rather than brilliant, he commanded his followers by strength of character rather than by arts of the politician. Washington's long journey from Mount Vernon... Hold on. <laughs> Excuse me, I chewed some ice. Washington's long journey from Mount Vernon to New York City, the temporary capital, was a triumphal procession. He was greeted by roaring cannon, ple peeling bells, fire-carpeted roads, and singing and shouting citizens. With appropriate ceremony, the solemnly and somewhat he solemnly and somewhat nervously took the oath of office on April 30, 1789, on a crowded balcony overlooking Wall Street, which some regarded as a bad omen. Washington soon put a stamp on new government, especially by establishing the cabinet. The Constitution does not mention a cabinet. It merely provides that the president may require written opinions of the heads of the executive branch departments. But this system proved so cumbersome that it involved so much homework that cabinet meetings gradually evolved in, in the Washington administration. At first, only three full-fledged departments had served under the president, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton, and Secretary of War Henry Knox. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, my voice is real scratchy right now. <laughs> the Bill of Rights. The new nation faced some unfinished business. Many anti-federalists and sharply criticized the Constitution. Many anti-federalists had sharply criticized the Constitution drafted at Philadelphia for its failure to provide guarantees of individual rights, such as freedom of religion and trial by jury. 
Many states had ratified the federal constitution on the understanding that it would soon be amended to include such guarantees. Drawing up a bill of rights headed the list of imperatives facing the new government. Amendments to the Constitution could be proposed in either of two ways, by a new constitutional convention requested by two-thirds of the states or by a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress. Fearing that a new convention might unravel the narrow Federalist victory in the ratification struggle, James Madison determined to draft the amendments himself. He then guided them through Congress, where his intellectual and political skills were quickly making him a leading figure. Adopted by the necessary number of states in 1791, the first ten amendments of the Constitution, popularly known as the Bill of Rights, safeguard some of the most precious American principles. Among these are protections for freedom of religion, speech, and the press, right to bear arms and be tried by jury, and the right to assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. The Bill of Rights also prohibits cruel and unusual punishments and arbitrary government seizure of private property. To guard against the danger that, enum that enumerating such rights might lead to the conclusion that they were the only ones protected, Madison inserted the crucial Ninth Amendment. It declares that specifying certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. In a gesture... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Wow. In a gesture of reassurance... Um, where was it? In a gesture... Of reassurance to the state's writers, he included the equally significant Tenth Amendment, which reserves all rights not explicitly delegated or prohibited by the federal constitution, to the states respectively, or to the people. By preserving a strong central government while specifying protections for minority and individual liberties, Madison's amendments partially swung the Federalist pendulum back in an anti-Federalist direction. The first Congress also nailed the other newly saw government planks into one place. It created effective federal courts under the Judiciary Act of 1789. The act organized the Supreme Court with a chief justice and five associates, as well as federal district and circuit courts, and established the office of the Attorney General. New Yorker John Jay, Madison's collaborator on the Federalist Papers and one of the Young Republic's most seasoned diplomats, became the first Chief Justice of the United States. Hamilton revised the Corpse of Public Credit. The key figure in the new government was still smooth-faced Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, a native of the British West Indies. Hamilton's genius was unquestioned, but critics claimed he loved his adopted country more than he loved his countrymen. Doubts about his character and loyalty to the Republican experiment always swirled about his head. Hamilton regarded himself as a kind of prime minister in Washington's cabinet and, on occasion, thrust his hands into the affairs of other departments, including that of his arch-rival, Thomas Jefferson, who served as Secretary of State. A financial wizard, Hamilton set out immediately to correct the economic vexations. <coughs> I sound dead. <laughs> A financial wizard, Hamilton set out immediately to correct the economic vexations that had crippled the Articles of Confederation. His plan was to shape the fiscal policies of the administration in such a way as to favor the wealthier groups. They, in turn, would gratefully lend the government monetary and political support. The new federal regime would thrive, the property classes would fatten, and prosperity would trickle down to the masses. The youthful financier's first objective was to bolster the national credit. Without public confidence in the government, Hamilton could not secure the funds with which to float his risky schemes. He therefore boldly urged Congress to fund the entire national debt at par and to assume completely the debts incurred by the states during the recent war. Funding, excuse me, funding at par meant that the federal government would pay off its debts at face value plus accumulated interest, a then enormous total of more than $54 million. So many people believe that the infant treasury incapable of meeting those obligations, that government bonds had depreciated t 10 or 15 cents on the dollar. Yet speculators ha held fistfuls of them, and when Congress passed in Hamilton's measure in 1790, they grabbed for more. Some of them galloped into rural areas ahead of the news, buying for a song the depreciated paper holdings of the farmers, war veterans, and widows. Hamilton was willing, even e eager, to have the new government shoulder additional obligations. While pushing the funding scheme, he urged Congress to assume the, state, the debts of the states, totaling some $21.5 million. The Secretary made a convincing case for the assumption. The state debts could be regarded as a proper national obligation, for they had been incurred in the war for independence, but foremost in Hamilton's thinking was the belief that the assumption would chain the states more tightly to the federal chariot. Thus, the Secretary's maneuver would shift the attachment of wealthy creditors from the states to the federal government. The support of the rich for the national administration was a crucial link in Hamilton's political strategy of strengthening the central government. States burdened but with heavy debts, like Massachusetts, were delighted by Hamilton's proposal. States with small debts, like Virginia, were less charmed. The, state was set, the stage was set for some old-fashioned horse trading. Virginia did not want the state's debts assumed, but it did want the forthcoming federal district, now the District of Columbia, to be located on the Potomac, Potomac River. He would thus gain in a commerce and prestige. Hamilton persuaded a reluctant Jefferson, who had recently come home from France, to line up enough votes in Congress for assumption. In return, Virginia would have the federal district on the Potomac. The bargain was carried through in 1790.
I'm talking with like my head voice so that my voice is not so scratchy. Customs duties and, and excise taxes. Excise taxes. The new ship of the sta state thus set sail dangerously overloaded. The national debt had swelled to $75 million owing to Hamilton's insistence on honoring the outstanding federal and state obligations alike. Anyone less determined to establish such a healthy public credit could have sidestepped $13 million back in interest and could have avoided the state's debts entirely. But Hamilton, father of the national debt, was not greatly worried. His objectives were as much political as economic. He believed that within the limits, a national debt was a national blessing, a kind of union adhesive. The more creditors to whom the government owed money, the more people there would be with personal stake, a personal stake in the success of his ambitious enterprise. His unique contribution was to make a debt, ordinarily a liability, an asset for vitalizing the financial system as well as the government itself. Where was the money to come from to pay, for, to pay interest on this huge debt and run the government? Hamilton's first answer was customs duties, derived from a tariff. Tariff revenues, in turn, depended on a vigorous foreign trade, another crucial link in Hamilton's overall economic strategy for the new republic. The first tariff law, imposing a low tariff of about 8% on the value of dutiable imports, was speedily passed by the first Congress in 1789, even before Hamilton was sworn in. Revenue was by far the main goal, but the measure was also designed to erect a low protective wall around infant industries, which balled noisily for more shelter than they received. Hamilton had the vision to see that the, the Industrial Revolution would soon reach America, and he argued strongly in favor of more protection for the well-to-do manufacturing groups, other, another vital element in the economic program. But Congress was still dominated by the agricultural and commercial interests, and it voted only two slight increases in the tariff during Washington's presidency. The Hamilton... <coughs> Excuse me. Hamilton, with the characteristic vigor, saw additional internal revenue and in 1791 secured from Congress an excise tax on, the, on a few domestic items, notably whiskey. The new levy of seven cents a gallon was borne chiefly by the distillers who lived in the backcountry, where the wretched roads forced the farmers to reduce and liquefy bulky bushels of grain to horseback proportions. Whiskey flowed so freely on the frontier in the form of distilled liquor that it was used for money. Hamilton battles Jefferson for a bank. As the capstone for his financial system, Hamilton proposed a bank of the United States. An enthusiastic admirer of most things English, he took as his model the Bank of England. Specifically, he proposed a powerful private institution, of which the government would be the major stockholder and in which the federal treasury would deposit its surplus monies. The central government not only would have a convenient strong box, but federal funds would stimulate business by remaining in circulation. The bank would also print urgently needed paper money and thus provide a sound and stable national currency, badly needed since the days when the continental dollar was not worth a continental. The proposed bank would indeed be useful, but was it constitutional? Jefferson, whose written opinion on this question Washington requested, argued vehemently against the bank. There was, he insisted, no specific authorization in the Constitution for such a financial octopus. He was convinced that all powers not specifically granted to the central government were reserved to the states, as provided in the about-to-be-ratified Bill of Rights. He therefore concluded that the states, not Congress, had the power to charter banks. Believing that the Constitution should be interpreted literally or strictly, Jefferson and his states' rights disciples zealously embraced the theory of strict construction. Hamilton, also at Washington's request, prepared a brilliantly reasoned reply to Jefferson's arguments. Hamilton, in general, believed that what the Constitution did not forbid, it permitted. Jefferson, in Congress, contrast, generally believed that what it did not permit, it forbade. Hamilton boldly invoked the clause of the Constitution that stipulates that Congress may pass any laws necessary and proper to carry, carry out the powers vested in the various government agencies. The government was explicitly empowered to collect taxes and regulate trade. In carrying out these basic functions, Hamilton argued a national bank would, not, would be not only proper but necessary by inference or implication, that is, by virtue of implied powers. Congress would be fully justified in establishing the Bank of the United States. In short, Hamilton contended for a loose or broad interpretation of the Constitution. He and his Federalist followers just thus involve, evolved the theory of loose construction by invoking the elastic clause of the Constitution, a precedent for enormous federal powers. Hamilton's financial views prevailed. His eloquent and realistic arguments were accepted by Washington, who reluctantly signed the banked measure into law. This explosive issue had been debated with much heat in Congress, where the old North-South cleavage still lurked ominously. The most enthusiastic support for the bank naturally came from the commercial and financial centers of the North, whereas the strongest opposition arose from the agricultural South. The Bank of the United States was created by Congress in 1791, was chartered for 20 years. Located in Philadelphia, it was to have a capital of $10 million, one-fifth of it owned by the federal government. Stock was thrown open to public scale. To the agreeable surprise of Hamilton, a mailing crowd oversubscribed in less than two hours, pushing aside many would-be purchasers.
mutinous moonshiners in Pennsylvania. The Whiskey Rebellion, which flared up in the southern, in southern western Pennsylvania in 1794, sharply challenged the, nation, the new national government. Hamilton's high excise tax bore harshly on these homespun pioneer folk. They regarded it as not a tax on frivolous, frivolous luxury, but as a burden on an economic necessity and a medium of exchange. Even preachers of the gospel were paid in old Mon Monongahela rye. Rye and corn crops distilled into alcohol were more cheaply transported to eastern markets than bales of grain. Defiance distillers finally erected whiskey poles, similar to the liberty poles of anti stab tax in anti-stamp tax days in 1765 and raised the cry, liberty and no excise. Bold, boldly tarring and feathering revenue officers, they brought collections to a halt. President Washington, once a revolutionary, was alarmed by what he called these self-created societies. With the hearty encouragement of Hamilton, he summoned the militias of several states. Anxious moments followed the call, for there was much doubt as to whether the men in other states would muster to crush a rebellion in a fellow state. Despite some opposition, an army of about 13,000 rallied to the colors, and two widely separated columns marched br briskly forth in a gorgeous, leaf-tinted Indian summer, until knee-deep mud slowed their progress. When the troops reached the hills of western Pennsylvania, they found no insurrection. The whiskey boys were overawed, dispersed, or captured. Washington, with an eye to healing old sores, pardoned the two small fry convicted culprits. The whiskey rebellion was minuscule. Some three rebels were killed, but its consequences were mighty. George Washington's government, now substantially strengthened, commanded a new respect. Yet the foes of the administration condemned its brutal display of force for having used a sledgehammer to crush a net. Uh, the emergence of political parties. Almost overnight, Hamilton's fiscal feats had established the government's sound credit rating. The Treasury could not borrow needed funds in the Netherlands on favorable terms. But Hamilton's financial successes, funding assumption, the excise tax, the bank, the suppression of the Whiskey Rebellion, created some political liabilities. All these schemes encroached sharply upon states' rights. Many Americans, dubious about the new constitution in the first place, might never have approved it if they had foreseen how the states were going to be overshadowed by the federal colossus. Now, out of resentment against Hamilton's revenue-raising and centralizing policies, an organized opposition began to build. What once was a personal feud between Hamilton and Jefferson developed into a full-blown and frequently bitter political rivalry. National political parties, in the modern sense, were unknown in America when George Washington took his inaugural oath. There had been Whigs and Tories, Federalists and Anti-Federalists, but these groups were factions rather than parties. They had sprung into existence over hotly contested special issues. They had faded away when their cause had triumphed or fizzled. The founders at Philadelphia had not envisioned the existence of permanent political parties. Organized opposition to the government, especially a democratic government based on popular consent, seems tainted by disloyalty. Opposition to the government affronted the spirit of national unity that the glorious cause of the revolution had inspired. The notion of a formal party apparatus was thus a novelty in the 1790s, and when Jefferson and Madison first first organized their opposition to the Hamilton program, they confined their activities to Congress and did not anticipate creating a long-lived and popular party. But as their antagonism to Hamilton stiffened, and as the amazingly boisterous and widely read newspapers of the day spread their political message and Hamilton's among the people, primitive semblances of political parties began to emerge. The two-party system had existed in the United States since that time. Ironically, in the light in light of the early suspicions about the very legitimacy of the parties, their competition for power has actually proved to be among the indispensable ingredients of a sound democracy. The party out of power, the loyal opposition, traditionally plays the invaluable role of the balance wheel on the machinery of government, ensuring that politics never drifts too far out of the kilter with the wishes of the people. Excuse me, I just burped again. The impact of the French Revolution. When Washington's first administration ended in early 1793, Hamilton's domestic policies had already stimulated the formation of two political camps, Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans and Hamilton Hamiltonian Federalists. As Washington's second term began, foreign policy issues brought the differences between them to a fever pitch. Only a few weeks after Washington's inauguration in 1789, the curtain had risen on the first act of the French Revolution. Twenty-six years were to pass before the seething continent of Europe collapsed into a piece of exhaustion. Few non-American events had left a deeper scar on American political and social life. In a sense, the French Revolution was misnamed. It was a historic, global revolution that sent tremors through much of the Western world and beyond. In its early stages, the upheaval was surprisingly peaceful, involving as it did a successful attempt to impose constitutional shackles on Louis XIV. The American people, loving liberty, actually Louis XVI, sorry. The American people, loving liberty and deploring desp despotism, cheered. They were flattered to think that the outburst in France was but the second chapter of their own glorious revolution, as to some extent it was. 
Only a few ultra-conservative Federalists, fearing change reform and leveling principles, were from the outset dubious or outspokenly hostile to the despicable malocracy. The more adjacent Jeffersonians were overjoyed. The more, the more ardent Jeffersonians were overjoyed. The French Revolution entered a more ominous phase in 1792 when France declared war on hostile Austria. Powerful ideals and powerful armies alike were on the march. Late in that year, the electrifying news reached America that French citizen armies had hurled back in the invading foreign held back the invading foreigners and that France had proclaimed itself a republic. Um, hold on, I'm going to finish up this little section and then read Thinking Globally. Americans enthusiastically sang the Marseillaise and other rousing French revolutionary songs, and they renamed thoroughfares with democratic flair. King Street in New York, for example, became Liberty Street, and in Boston, Royal Exchange Alley became Equality Lane. But centuries of pent-up poison could not be purged without baleful results. The guillotine was set up, and the king was beheaded in 1793. The church was attacked, and the head-rolling reign of terror was begun. Back in America, God-fearing Federalist aristocrats nervously fingered their tender white necks and eyed the Jeffersonian masses apprehensively. Lukewarm Federalist approval of the early revolution turned, almost overnight, to heated talk of blood-drinking cannibals. Sober-minded Jeffersonians regretted the bloodshed, but they felt with Jefferson that one could not expect to be carried from despotism to liberty in a feather bed, and that a few thousand aristocratic heads were a cheap price to pay for human freedom. Such approbation was short-sighted, for dire, dire peril loomed ahead. The earlier battles of the French Revolution had not hurt America directly, but now Britain was sucked into the contagious conflict. The confl conflagration speedily spread to the New World, where it vividly affected the expanding young American Republic. Thus was repeated the familiar story of every major European war, beginning with 1688, that involved a watery duel for control of the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, now I'm going to read Thinking Globally. One second. Two revolutions. On July 14, 1789, a howling mob stormed the Bastille, a dank Parisian prison described by the, Mar by the Marquis de Lafayette, de Lafayette, my goodness, I can't read, by the Marquis de Lafayette as France's fortress of despotism, killed half a dozen soldiers and paraded the severed heads of its commanding officer and the mayor of Paris throughout the city. The French Revolution was thus bloodily launched. Bastille Day is still celebrated as France's national birthday, just as Americans celebrate the 4th of July. The, two roots of the, the roots of the two revolutions were thickly intertwined. To defray the cost of the war that had ousted France from the North American in 1763, Britain had levied new taxes on its colonists, provoking them to revolt in 1776. In turn, aiding the rebellious Americans forced the French government to seek new revenues, lighting the fuse that had led to the political explosion in Paris in 1789. Even more notable was the intellectual commonality between the upheavals. The ideas that inspired the American and French revolutionaries grew from the common heritage of radical 18th century enlightenment thinking about equality, freedom, and the sovereignty of the people. The French Declaration of the Rights of Man deliberately echoed Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence when it said that men are born and remain free and equal in rights, among which were liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. Many French thinkers openly credited the, credited the American Revolution as the inspiration for their own. As the American revolutionary Thomas Paine remarked to George Washington, the principles of America opened the Bastille. Indeed, in many ways, the French were even more radical than the Americans. Their revolution, their revolution abolished slavery, temporarily, something the Americans failed to do for almost 100 years more. And yet the American and French revolutions unfolded in dramatically different ways and left vastly different legacies. The Americans largely disarmed after winning their independence, allowed some 80,000 hardcore loyalists to depart without suffering grievous retribution, peacefully resumed their harbors of worship, toil, and governance, and proceeded to draft the U.S. Constitution under which they had lived, with amendments for more than two centuries. The American revolutionaries, in short, secured the fruits of their revolution fairly easily, while the French struggled through ghastly bloodshed to ultimate failure, an outcome that haunted European politics for at least a century thereafter. Revolutionaries in France had to grapple with the constant threats of counter-revolution at home and armed intervention from abroad. As a result, they soon descended into grisly violence, including the execution of some 40,000 Frenchmen in the notorious Reign of Terror, the guillotining of the king and queen, the preemptive attacks on neighboring countries. They stripped the Catholic Church of its property and privileges, briefly experimented with a new state religion called the Cult of Reason, and eventually conceded supreme power to a brash young general, Napoleon Bonaparte. He's my favorite who convulsed all of Europe in the name of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Napoleon was finally defeated at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, after which the Bourbon monarchy was restored to the throne. Why did these two great eruptions sprung from a shared chain of events and espousing almost identical political philosophies fare so differently? Many scholars have found the answer in the countries are marked markedly different 
pre-revolutionary histories. France's revolution confronted implacably entrenched adversaries in the landed, no landed nobility and the clergy. These two estates, as they were called, clung tenaciously onto their ancient privileges, as did the princes and potentates who ruled in all the countries on France's borders. To succeed, the French Revolution had to concentrate power in the hands of the state powerful enough to extinguish its eternal enemies and to forestall forward in intervention as well. Those stark necessities help account for the fact that down to the present day, central governments are stronger in almost all European societies than in the United States. The Americans faced no such obstacles. They had no aristocracy worth of name, no church with the kind of influence that the Catholic, the Catholic Church commanded in France, and no menacing neighbors to fear. They had the luxury of being able to focus on limiting the power of the state, not enlarging it. Theirs was largely a colonial conflict, whereas France had to endure a, cas a, class, a class conflict. <laughs> Not until re Reconstruction following the Civil War would Americans confront a comparable task of mustering sufficient power to uproot and permanently extinguish an entire social order. It has been said that to mount a revolution is to murder and create. What was exceptional about the American revolutionaries was that they were spared the necessity to murder. The American Revolution grew not from extract ideas, but from the preceding two centuries of American experience. It was less a revolution in the usual percents in the usual sense than a consolidation of already well-established norms, values, and behaviors. Alexander Hamilton understood that crucial point when he wrote to the Marquis de Lafayette in 1789, I dread the reveries of your philosophic politicians. Okay, um... Now, Washington's Neutrality Proclamation. On the next page. Ominously, the Franco-American Alliance of 1778 was still on the books was well, still on the books. <laughs> By its own terms, it was to last forever. It bound to the United States to help the French defend their West Indies against future foes, and the booming British fleets were certain to attack these strategic islands. Many Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans favored honoring the, elite, the alliance. Aflame with the liberal ideas of the French Revolution, red-blooded Jeffersonians were eager to enter the conflict against Britain, the recent foe at the side of France, the recent friend. America owed France its freedom, they argued, and now was the time to pay the debt of gratitude. But President George Washington, level-headed as usual, was not swayed by the clamor of the crowd. Backed by Hamilton, he believed that war had to be avoided at all costs. Washington was coolly playing for enormous stakes. The nation in 1793 was militarily feeble, economically wobbly, and politically disu disunited. But solid foundations were being laid, and American cradles were continuing to rock a bumper crop of babies. Washington wisely reasoned that if America could avoid the broils of Europe for a generation or so, it would then be populous enough and powerful enough to assert its maritime rights with strength and success. Otherwise, it might invite catastrophe. The strategy of delay, of playing for time while the birthright fought America's battles, was a cardinal policy of the Founding Fathers. This principle of strategic patience was based on the shrewd assessment of American strengths and weaknesses at this critical moment in the young republic's history. Hamilton and Jefferson, often poles apart on their other issues, were in broad agreement here. Accordingly, Washington boldly assumed, issued his neutrality proclamation in 1793, shortly after the outbreak of war between Britain and France. This epical document not only proclaimed the government's official neutrality in the widening conflict, but also sternly warned American citizens to be impartial toward both armed camps. As America's first formal declaration of aloofness from the Old World quarrels, Washington's neutrality proclamation proved to be a major prop of the spreading isolationist tradition. It also proved to be enormously controversial. Many zealously pro-French Jeffersonians were enraged by the Neutrality Proclamation, especially by Washington's method of announcing it unilaterally, without consulting Congress. The pro-British Federalists were heartened. Debate soon intensified. An impetuous 30-year-old representative of the French Republic, citizen Edmund Genet, had landed on, at Charleston, South Carolina. With unrestrained zeal, he undertook to fit out privateers and otherwise take advantage of the existing Franco-American alliance. The giddy-headed envoy, all sail and no anchor, was soon swept away by his enthusiastic reception by the Jeffersonian Republicans. He foolishly came to believe that the Neutrality Proclamation did not reflect the true wishes of the American people, and he consequently embarked upon an unneutral activity not authorized by the French alliance, including the recruitment of armies to invade Spanish Florida and Louisiana, as well as British Canada. Even Madison and Jefferson were soon disillusioned by his conduct. After he threatened to appeal over the head of old Washington to the southern voters, the president demanded Genet's withdrawal, and the Frenchman was replaced by a less impulsive emissary. Washington's neutrality proclamation clearly illustrates the truism that self-interest is the basic cement of alliances. In 1778, both France and America stood to gain. In 1793, only France. Technically, the Americans did not flout their obligation because France never officially called upon them to honor it. 
American neutrality, in fact, favored France. The French West Indies urgently needed Yankee foodstuffs. If Americans had entered the war at France's side, the British fleets would have bl blockaded the American coast and cut off those essential supplies. America was thus much more useful to France as a reliable neutral provider than as a blockaded partner in arms. The embroilments with Britain. <coughs> Excuse me. President Washington's far-visioned policy of neutrality was sorely tried by the British. For ten long years, they had been retaining the chain of northern frontier posts on U.S. soil, all in defiance of the Peace Treaty of 1783. The London government was reluctant to abandon the lucrative fur, 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 fur trade in the Great Lakes region and also hoped to build up an Indian buffer state to contain the ambitious Americans. British agents openly sold firearms and firewater to the Indians of the Miami Confederacy, an alliance of eight Indian nations who terrorized Americans invading their lands. Little Turtle, war chief of the Miamis, gave notice that the Confederacy regarded the Ohio River as the United States' northwestern and their own south southeastern border. In 1790 and 1791, the Little Turtles' braves defeated armies led by Generals Josiah Harmer and Arthur St. Clair, killing hundreds of soldiers and handing the United States what remains one of its worst defeats in the history of the frontier. But in 1794, when a new army under General Mad Anthony Wayne routed the, America, routed the Miamis at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, the British refused to shelter Indians fleeing from the battle. Abandoned when it counted, when it counted by their red-coated friends, the Indians soon offered Wayne the peace pipe. In the Treaty of Greenville, signed in August 1795, the, oh, excuse me, the Confederacy gave up vast tracts of the Old Northwest, including the most of the present-day Indian Indiana uh, and Ohio. In exchange, the Indians received a lump sum payment of $20,000, an annual annuity, annuity of $9,000, the right to hunt the lands that they had ceded, and most important, what they hoped was recognition of their sovereign status. Although the treaty codified an unequal relationship, the Indians felt that it put some limits on the ability of the United States to decide the fate of the Indian peoples. On the sea frontier, the British were eager to starve out the French West Indies and naturally expected the United States to defend them under the Franco-American alliance. Hard-boiled commanders of the Royal Navy, ignoring America's rights as a neutral, struck, savi struck savagely. They seized about 300 American merchant ships in the West Indies, impressed scores of seamen into service on British vessels, and threw hundreds of others into the foul dungeons. These actions, especially impressment, incensed patriotic Americans. A mighty outcry arose, chiefly from the Jeffersonians, that America should once again fight George III in defense of its liberties. At the very least, it should cut off, it should cut off all supplies to its oppressor through a nationwide embargo but the Federalists stoutly resisted all demands for drastic action. Hamilton's high hopes for economic development depended on trade with Britain. War with the world's mightiest commercial empire would pierce the heart of the Hamiltonian financial system. <coughs> <coughs> okay, that's done. Yahoo! My god, my voice is so scratchy. Okay. <laughs>